thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Participants, please respond. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we can hear you. I can hear you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I do not take it lightly. I appreciate the Institute for coming up with a program like this. And then I cherish the privilege and opportunity given to me to be of service to our great Institute. Uh, and I look forward to having a very nice time with you, uh, my dear friends uh, and participants this morning. And then uh, I, I hope at the end of the day, we will all go home with something. I would have learned from you, you would have learned you know, from me. Because of time, uh, I guess the introduction has been, has been absolutely done. And because of time, I will not waste time wanting to know you. But perhaps uh, at the end of the session, I may ask you to briefly also show your screen so that I can see your face. It's only fair that you're seeing my face and, and also see your face at the end of the day. You know, having said that, uh, let's go straight to business. Uh, I will also like to tell you that uh, this, is, this is an adult class in course, and then this is a class of practitioners, actually. So we are here basically to just shampoo one another, you know, swap. So I will learn from you, you will learn from me. So what I'm saying in essence is that I love a very interactive class. I love interactive class. I'm conscious of time. Uh, because I don't want Mr. Moderator to come and boost me out, you know, when his time is up. So I'm going to be very conscious of time, you know, so I may not be giving the opportunity, you know, for you to talk, you know, but we'll be interacting through the chat box. If what I have said, for a start, if what I have said is very clear to you, can I have you, you know, drop 555 on the chat box? If you heard me clearly, and then you agree with what I have said, and we are together, please drop 555 in the chat box. Let me test your level of interaction. Dear participants, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kumi Willowi, Mrs. Intajibala Daudu, thank you. Mr. Michael Emeka, thank you. Mrs. Veronica Isisa, thank you. Chikube Manuela, thank you. Okay, Bonoala Fashio, thank you. Tony Bashio, Polaka Mijekede, Justina Lewa, thank you, thank you. Okay, so that's fine. That's beautiful, so let's just go straight into what we have for today. Yes, we want to talk about organizational risk management. Uh, permit me to just break the eyes at this point, but when you're talking about organizational risk management, basically what you're referring to is a holistic approach to managing the risk, you know, that the company is particularly, you know, exposed to. You know, so in some quarters or in some other semantics, that could easily be referred to as enterprise you know, risk management. So it's going to be the core of what we will talk about this morning. But I would like to start. Sorry, I'm trying to push my slides. Okay. So I would like to start with a thought, you know, this morning. And that thought is, in the 21st century, it's not my, it's not my, it's not my thought, it's Alvin Toffler that said it. He said, in the 21st century, those who cannot read and write will not be the illiterate. The illiterate in the 21st century and beyond will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. You know, so on that ground, I'd like to congratulate every one of us here today because our uh, being in this class shows that we are open minded, we are open to learning. I can bet you that a lot of us here are probably existing members of the Institute or existing members of one institute or the other or, uh, you know, office holders in one office or the other. But for you to be here shows how open you are to learning. So congratulations to you. You are not an illiterate of the 21st century. Having said that, our learning outline, our learning outlook, you know, this morning, or outline as you may want to call it. Uh, by the end of this session, I'm hoping, you know, that every one of us will be able to locate risk management in the corporate government framework in every entity. Because we will be talking as a matter of generality, uh, you know, this morning. So in any entity at any point in time, by the end of the day, you should be able to, uh, you know, locate and identify the risk management, uh, you know, framework in the existing corporate governance framework. At the end of the day, you should be able to describe the nature of risk and enterprise risk management 
process. At the end of the day, at this session I made, you should be able to identify the role of board in the entire risk management framework. At the end of the day as well, you should be able to explain the importance of business continuity planning because we cannot be talking about sustainability and risk without you know, making mention of you know, business continuity planning. Having said that, I would like to start with the end in mind. The essence of trying to manage risk or the essence or any endeavor or any entity is to deliver long-term values. And then when you're talking about long-term values, you're talking about sustainability. So I like to start with that big picture. You know, it naturally should be the last we will talk about, but I would like to start with the end, you know, in mind. You know, so having said that, uh, what then is sustainability? I have, I have put, you know, three-dimensional definition, uh, you know, here for you. You know, the first, you know, definition basically define sustainability as development that meets the needs, the present needs, without, you know, compromising the needs of future generations. So in other words, development, you know, that has evolved and is able to propose solutions to us today without depriving posterity ability to provide solutions to their own problems. So that's number one, uh, you know, definition of, uh, my, my number one definition of sustainability, uh, you know, this morning. Another one, you know, that I have said is the fact that sustainability is an approach, you know, to business. An approach in which you, you try to create value. You try to create value and that value in turn sustains that entity, sustains the company, sustain the enterprise, and then as well, you know, sustain a mechanism for churning out resources in the enterprise. Or the third approach, the third, you know, dimension, you know, that I've got to the definition of sustainability is the fact that it is a business approach that seeks to build long-term competitiveness. Of course, uh, while you are trying to build value, part of the value every organization or everybody governing organization should try to deliver to stakeholders is an ability to be an urge, to be, to be, to be one, two, three steps ahead of your competitors. To be one, two, three steps ahead of your competitors. So your ability to be ahead of your competitor is an inherent component of the long-term value that you should be striving to deliver for the company. You know, so I said sustainability is a business approach that seeks to build a long, you know, long competitiveness without compromising on dealing the short-term profitability and cash flow. So if I'm supposed to put that in another world, you know, sustainability, you know, propels you to keep your eyes on the ultimate without you, you know, compromising the immediate. Because the ultimate is an accumulation. The ultimate is an aggregate of various immediate, if you get what I'm saying. You know, so we have an immediate, we have various spaces, you know, in business development cycles, in company cycles, in product cycles, you have different spaces. You know, but there's an ultimate goal, there's an ultimate objective. You know, so why you have your gaze on that ultimate objective, you are not compromising, you know, the immediate. So I'll just go through my definitions again to drive it home, because that's the big picture here. Sustainability, essentially, you know, is the development that meets the needs of today, provides solutions for today, and as well, give room for the future generation to propose solutions for them. I mean, there are a lot of talks about, about uh, you know, sustaining, you know, the environment, the ozone layer, you know, keep space and all of that. You know, so don't use up nature, you know, to sustain yourself, to develop yourself, to provide solutions, you know, for yourself now. And such that the future generation will not be able to cope. So that's one dimension. Another dimension says it is the creation of value. That value in turn, you know, sustains the entity that has churned it out. 
and then it also helps you know to sustain the entire system of the entity it also helps to sustain the mechanism for churning out you know resources which that particular value you know depends on and then lastly i said the business approach you know that seeks to build a long run you know competitiveness without compromising short-term profitability and cash flow i believe that's a very good foundation you know and that's a very good way to to, to to start with the end in mind having said that you know what are indicators you know of sustainability what are good indicators you know of sustainability what 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 you know parameters do you see in your business in your activities in the in the state of affairs of your business that indicate to you that you are on the path you know to sustainability number one is good return of capital uh the essence of business you know by the way uh, because of time i would have loved to say okay let people define business but i'm sure if i tell every one of us to define business we will probably define it uh you know from the perspective of saying it is the exchange of value for value you know it is the exchange of value for value the exchange of you know goods and services for value <clears throat> with an intention you know for profitability and as such the value the company is creating there's a cost to it and some people pay the price you know for that cost and as such the stakeholders that have staked you know their resources into that into that venture expect some form of some form of return you know so when a business you know is turning out with some you recall one of our definitions that says that look it is the creation of value and that value helps to sustain the system and helps as well, you know, to sustain, you know, the resources, you know, of that, uh, uh, you know, particular entity. So uh, a business entity, you know, has been set up at a cost, you know, so the cost, you know, that was sunk into setting that business up, into running that business is expected to yield some form of return. You know, so when, you know, a business entity is yielding return, uh, at different phases of, of, of an organizational development. When I say organizational development, I mean company cycles, you know, that, you know, from start up, you know, to growth, you know, to saturation point, to decline, you know, all of that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, that cycle. So return at each point in time in that business cycle may fluctuate. However, the most important thing here is that the business you know, must be on a constant, uh, you know, goal of generating return on the capital that's been invested. So when that happens, you know, you're on the path to sustainability. Another is increased operational efficiency and optimal cost. Efficiency, you know, efficiency infers, uh, uh, you know, right allocation, you know, proportional allocation, you know, of resources into endeavor and let's say the resources of the company proportionally you know into various activities at optimal cost optimal cost i i don't like to always use the word minimal cost because it infers that you know cost is just the focus and then you sacrifice every other thing at the expense of cost you know but i i usually prefer the use of the word you know optimal cost what that infers is you know as practical as possible as economic you know as possible so increase operational efficiency and then optimal uh, you know cost because anything of quality anything of value never comes cheaply just that you should not overpay for it as well and that's why uh, you know i prefer the use of the word optimal you know so increase operational efficiency and optimal cost minimal employee turnover minimal employee turnover i mean why change the winning team both from the perspective of the employer and the employee. When the employee sees a career path, when the employee sees, you know, job satisfaction, when the employee sees good welfare, when the employee sees a company of the future, what would be the reason to move on? The essence, you know, of life is to seek, the, the essence of the efforts we all make in life and career path is to seek greener pastures. You know, so if you are in a place, I mean, take for example, uh, without wanting to badmouth any country. Why would you be a citizen and living in, 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 in a country, for example, like Singapore, Canada, or any of those less stressful, uh, you know, uh, you know, less stressful countries? 
and you want to leave that to go into a poverty, war speaking nation. Nobody does that, except if that is where you come from, or you have, uh, you know, a service to render that. But as a matter of natural, you know, disposition of us as human beings, you don't want to leave such a plan, you know, to such a bad plan. The same thing operates, you know, in business for employees, you know, who are part and parcel of a particular organization. If they see a career path, if there is, there is there's respect for human rights, you know, if there is good welfare package, if there is competitive pay, uh, uh, you know, they are promoted as a and then they see that company as well as the company of the future. What would be the reason to do? And then all of these goodies that I've mentioned, you know, are features of, you know, a company headed towards sustainability. You know, so when there is minimal employee turnover, I mean, Minimal is the one. I didn't say when there's no turnover. I mean, for whatever reason, you know, some employees will get to the peak of the ladder of their career path in a company and they need to move on. Or some people may just want to be off They want they want to start their own thing. So for whatever reason, you know, some employees will still do. But it should be minimal. And it will not be for the reason, you know, of 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 bad omen, you know, from the company. Another thing is enhanced, you know, brand advantage, enhanced competitive, you know, advantage. This was already incorporated, you know, in one of my definitions of sustainability that I gave. You know, so when the company is continually thriving, continually at, a, at an advantage over its competitors, over fellow brands, you know, it's headed, you know, towards sustainability. And I give you an example. Uh, you know, they asked one of the founding partners there of Coca Cola, you know, that if you guys were supposed to wait today, I've forgotten his name now, what would you take? He said, I will ask for the brand. I mean, Coca Cola is a brand that has stood the test of time. HP is a brand that has stood the test of, you know, of time. Toyota is a brand that has stood the test of time. And so many other brands, you know, like that. These companies have been sustained from generation to generation. And they are watching, you know, even much more stronger, even in the present day, you know, reality. Okay, another thing is sufficient financial and investment opportunity. This has to do with, with business development, opportunity, you know, creation, business development, product, you know, development. In other words, if we are supposed to put it, innovation, a company that is constantly innovating will definitely be sustainable and uh, innovation creativity. Uh, I mean, improving of products, you know, doing things in a better way and all of that. They are features, you know, of companies headed for sustainability. And then lastly, of course, this is not exhaustive, but for the purpose of our time, you know, lastly, effective risk management, you know, and compliance. One of the, one of, one of the easiest way, you know, to move from Slowly to grass or from, from grace to grass, as they say, uh, you know, is when you are constantly speaking with a lot of a lot of fines and a lot of sanctions. You know, so company, you know, that are headed towards sustainability will be compliant. Compliance, you know, with with specification of brand promise of, of product promise to customers. Compliance, you know, with laws and regulations. Compliance with governance code. Compliance, you know, with industry, industry set, you know, codes and, and business operation specifications and so on and so forth. You know, so a business or a company that wants to be sustainable is not such, you know, that works on the on the on the misfortunate path, you know, of constant danger, constant sanction, and constant fines, just because of carelessness of not complying. Then of course, a company that will be, you know, sustainable will be a company that has an effective risk management framework, a risk an effective risk management framework, to the extent that a company can only exist in its own operational efficiency. You cannot control the global reality, but an ability to constantly identify events that pose threats to you as an entity, and to position yourself you know, to, to, to outlive, you know, such events is what is indicative of an effective risk management, you know, framework. 
Uh, so those are indicators. Uh, if you have any question or any comment, you could always talk to me or drop it in the chat. Uh, but because of time constraints, I will be you know, moving on. So let's let's just try to define risk as well. Because we're talking about risk management. Uh, so we need to understand the nature of you know basically you know of risk. And because we are talking about you know risk from an organizational holistic perspective, uh, you know. I will refer to, 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 to it a lot from the perspective of events, events that pose danger, you know, or hazard, or possibility of hazard to the company. Okay, so let's quickly look at what I have here. Uh, I said risk is the possibility, you know, that events will occur and affect the achievement of strategy and business objectives. When I was talking about sustainability, you know, earlier on, uh, when I, was, when I gave the illustration about the big picture and then the immediate people. Of course, when you're talking about the big picture, sustainability itself, in its, in, its, in its nature, is one of the objectives of an entity. Profitability is one of the objectives you know, of an entity. Uh, it's not cast in stone. Some companies you know, have the objective to, be, to, be, to, to have plans present in all nations of the world. It's an objective. Some companies have the objective of being industry leaders. Some companies have, you know, the objective of being global leaders. You know, so those are chunks. Those are chunks, you know, of objectives. And the moment there is objective, you know, composite, you know, with it is usually strategy. You cannot, you cannot set an objective without, you know, without crafting a strategy. You cannot set an objective without having you know, crafting, you know, strategy. Permit me as well to quickly illustrate and say, look, uh, the program today, uh, by insight of privileged information, the program of today is a strategy, you know, by exam towards a certain objective. We are, our institutes, you know, is a leading, you know, governance voice globally. You know, as a matter of fact, we are currently, you know, the vice, you know, president of the CSIA. You know, that's the global body that the Corporate Secretary International Association, the global body, the Nigerian body is currently, uh, you know, the vice president. Once upon a time, we used to just be, you know, an offshoot of the UK, but now we got an autonomy and we are sitting in council, even with the government institutes in UK. You understand? So uh, to constantly, to constantly, you know, stamp our authority as the governance institute, the institute needs to churn out, you know, uh, you know, practitioners who are capable in every area of governance. And one key area of governance, you know, is governance audit, is board, board, board evaluation, risk management, uh, you know, setting up risk management framework, ETC, and all of that. You know, so that was why I said that this program is a strategy, you know, by Ixan to constantly churn out, you know, practitioners who will fill this space. And the more they fill this space in the economy, the more Ixan continues to occupy that its, its space, you know, as a leader in governance, you know, practice in Nigeria and beyond. So what I'm saying is that risk is the possibility that an event will occur. An event will occur and it will affect, you know, the achievement of that strategy or the effective application of that strategy and the achievement of your business objectives. You know, so from this particular definition that I've given now, you know, I, I, I have pointed out, you know, three key things. Number one is event and occurrence, you know, and I'm trying to apply it, you know, uh, you know, to an organization. I'm trying to apply it to an organization. Sorry, I want to check my time a bit. I'm watching my time. Uh, you know, I'm trying to apply it to an organization. So for an organization, activities happen around you. Occurrences happen, you know, around you that would affect you know, the achievement of your organizational goals, positively or negatively, you know, so an event. Another thing is uncertainty. You know, the fact that you don't know how this event will occur. If at all, you know, they occur. These are natures of risk. And then another thing is that you don't know the severity of occurrence when, you know, they happen. I also, on the right side of your screen as well, I also gave another, you know, definition that risk is the potential event, action or inaction. Because we are talking from the perspective of, of an organization. I mean, uh, 
the, 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 the Finance Act 2021, you know, came up with this point, you know, that says to uh, unpaid dividends of total so number of years, uh, dormant accounts of total so number of years are supposed to be transferred into a certain form. You know, there are dynamics. I know the institute's position about that, uh, but we are not here to discuss that. But what I want to point out there is the fact that whether you accept it or not, you see, you see those forms that are left there, you know, uh, uh, you know, on you are potential targets for podcasts. And then if you add the banks, I know there are bankers here, uh, you know, uh, uh, today. I, I, I was once an auditor in the banking, you know, industry. I know that such, you know, dormant accounts are targets, you know, for customers. You understand what I'm saying? You know, such accounts or such of claim dividends. People in personnel just to come and claim it, you know, and all of that. Now, the question as to the sincerity, the honesty of the governments as to dispensing it, they say it is a loan, they will always. I'm not going to go into that dynamic, but I want to, you know, use it to illustrate the inaction that I said there. So that means, you know, a threat can arise either from your action or inaction. Our uh, risk management is, is a full model, you know, but we have two hours. So I'm, I, I, I won't delve into, into the nitty gritty of all that can be said, but I just want to, you know, stress it, you know, that some action or some inaction will threaten your organization's ability to achieve you know, their objectives. And then of course, these actions, you know, like I said, uh, could go up or could go down. In other words, they could affect positively, their outcomes could affect positively, you know, or negatively. Uh, when it's the downside impact, when it has a negative impact, it will hinder the achievement of corporate objectives. If the turnout of events, you know, has a positive impact on your activity, it will enhance the achievement of the objectives. You know, so uh, after today, we are not going to be seen, and as government practitioners, we are not going to be seen with, from the perspective of thinking, you know, that this is certain hazard. This is just possibility. It's just, it's just probability of the turnout of events. Events, you know, that can affect your organizational framing. Let's move on. Thank you. So risk capital. Of course, you cannot. We are, we are, we are, we are gravitating towards, uh, you know, risk management, and you cannot be talking about risk management without you defining certain things, especially from from the perspective of an organization. Uh, so you see, uh, an organization that wants to be effective at defining or at managing its risk, we need to we need to you know define some parameters. We need to set some objectives. We need to set out how it wants to operate. You know, uh, I mean, why am I conscious of time this morning? Because the organizers of this program have said to me, okay, prepare your slides, you have so, so, so time. Why? Because there are other, you know, presenters, there are other participators who are on queue to come and, you know, add value to this uh, you know, particular activity. So if that was not defined, I could just come here and then talk forever. You will even get tired, go home, come back, but it's been defined. So for 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 effective, you know, achievement of purpose in any endeavor of life, you will need to define, you know, your parameters. You need to you need to define, you know, how you want to play, what tools you want to choose, you know, to play. You know, so that's it's just what risk appetite is, you know, to establishment of a risk management framework in an organization. Okay, so risk appetite basically, you know, is the level of risk that an organization, you know, is willing to accept while pursuing its organizational objectives. Uh, you know, before any action is determined to be necessary in order to deal, you know, the risk. So in other words, uh, uh, of what we are saying, okay, I, I also put an ISO, you know, definition, which simply says that look, risk appetite is the amount and type of risk that an organization is willing to pursue or to permit or to retain. Okay, so what we're saying in essence is that, yes, this is our goal. We want to achieve this goal. What are we willing to take? You know, when I was talking about the indicators of sustainability, I was talking about returns, returns of 
from capital. I did say to you that you know, the setting up by the promoters of the company, the provision of working capital and all of that come at a cost. A cost to some people. You understand what I'm saying? So for every endeavor in life, there's always you know a cost. So what we are saying here is that yes, we want to achieve this objective. What are we willing to take as an entity? And it's important to define that. Uh, because when you define that at the top, you know, this, you know, will be, will, it will permeate through the thinking process, through the mindset of all your good, good soldiers. You know, they have an idea of, you know, the boundary. Not because you couldn't do more. You could decide at any point in time to go, you know, to go aggressive, you know, with your risk philosophy. You could go at any point in time to say that you want to depending on your objective. I mean, uh, for the women, uh, on a lighter note, for the women here, you will, you will recall the days when you were being wooed, you know, into marriage, and somebody will say to you, you know, that I will do anything for you. I will, I will, I will swim the ocean. I will swim the Atlantic Ocean, you know, for you. I don't know how many of the men said that, yeah? You know, I will swim the Atlantic Ocean, you know, for you. I will, I will hug, you know, uh, uh, transformer and, and, and stop the electricity for you. In other words, what the guy is communicating to you is this. You are, you are a precious jewel to me and I will take anything just to have you. Uh, how well they keep that from is not a discussion you know, for this class. You know, but I'm just using it to illustrate what this, what this exercise is. You, know, if you you sat down as an entity, as an organization, you said, yes, yeah, this is the objective we want to achieve. Now, what are the events, what are the activities that we're going to meet on the road to that destination? What are we willing, you know, to do that just to get to that, you know, destination? That, you know, will determine a lot of things. So that basically, you know, is, you know, risk appetite. And you see, in, in, in arriving at your risk appetite, you consider quite a number of things. Number one is that you want to consider your, your, your capacity, then you want to consider your preference. I mean, for example, uh, there are usually these sayings, you know, that say that cut your coat right according to your size. Then some schools of thought come and say, well, don't cut it according to your size. Cut it according to the material, you know, that you have. Uh, but you imagine yourself, even if you have all of the materials, depending on the style, our women, you know, will relate more. Our ladies will be, will be less more. You see, the fact that you have, you know, 20 yards of a material, do you understand? Does not mean you should, you should, you should sew it into that 20 yards. If the style you want to achieve for time is something skimpy or something smart, that is what will determine what quantum of that material you will cut and use to make the dress. You know, so what we're saying here is that before you before you decide what your risk appetite is, you are first going to consider what your capacity is. You know, so what we're saying here is that you do not have to exhaust your capacity just in pursuit of a certain objective. You could choose to be put out with yourself and exhaust your capacity to pursue. Do you understand? But you don't have to. You could say, okay, this is the capacity that we have, but what we prefer to risk at any point in time, is this quantum? You know, so after consideration of all of those, is when you arrive at this appetite. And that's the reason why I've just, I've just done this simple, uh, you know, illustration. And if for any reason uh, you don't have this, I'm not sure if this is in the slide, this is apologies, because I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't get the authorization to publicly use it. And I'm not gonna, you know, send a content into a public document, you know, that I'm not got to, I'm, I'm, I'm permitted to you because of my involvement in certain associations. I didn't have, you know, the authorization to do. So it's not my making. You understand what I'm saying? For illustrative and teaching purpose, it's not out of place. But it may not be, you know, in your slides as it were. So please bear with me if some of you are just want to that just simple way. Okay, so like I was saying, which capacity. The risk you can afford, risk tolerance is the risk you know you prefer. Now, of course, 
which threshold is when uh, you know your your risk tolerance is expressed in quantity. You know, for bankers, we cannot lend more than so 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 percent. You know, of so so so. Those are those those are definitions of threshold. That risk tolerance is absolute. You know, expressed in absolute terms. Then of course you have risk appetite. You consider all of these before you arrive at the risk. You know, appetite. And then you have risk statement. You know, your risk statement is just you know your philosophy. Some people call it risk philosophy. If you pick you know the credit policy of any bank or any lending entity, you will see the first thing you will see is that they will have their risk philosophy. You understand? It's a statement about their risk appetite. About about whether they are aggressive or they are conservative. Some people are risk averse from organization, while some 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 you know uh, some organizations are very open. You know, to risk. Let's quickly look at categories of risk. You know, let's quickly look at categories of risk. You know, so I put before you you know some three categories of risk: business risk, internal risk, and then because we are talking about governance. We are trying to identify, you know, risk within the corporate governance framework. So we must talk about the, the, the risk as well that are associated with governance. And so let's quickly look at business risk. Business risk, you know, are like external risk. There are risks, you know, that occur at the externalities of the company, and as such, the company is not directly in control of them. Unlike internal risk. You know, where yeah, there are there are issues within the company, and then the company can fully control them. So let me just look at that very quickly. Reputational risk. You know, reputational risk. Sorry, uh, time pressure. Reputational risk. You know, essentially refers, you know, to the risk or to the possibility, you know, that of potential customers or existing customers who refuse patronize the company or continue to patronize the company because of a perceived image of the company. Reputational risk is the risk, you know, that you can lose out on some patronage on the ground of how you are perceived, on the ground of the image of you that is in the marketplace. And this is a very key risk for risk managers here, for board members here, you know, for corporate, uh, corporate, corporate, uh, you know, uh, uh, company certificates, you know, here who are involved, you know, in in business decisions and all of that, you realize that every serious-minded organization will never take reputational risk, you know, for granted. As a matter of fact, that's why companies have, you know, corporate affairs, uh, you know, units, and then you put very senior officers there to manage the affairs of the company internally and externally. And then a lot of companies do a lot of PR. When I say PR, I'm not talking, you know, in the, in the use of it of private and a lot of them. No, public public relations, uh, uh, you know, expenses. I'll give you an example. You know, some years ago, uh, because of the war in the marketplace in certain industries, some people came and said, "Come and gamble." You know, that they come into the country, you know, uh, the owners are. Uh, uh, they are sent short of the devil and all of that. Knowing very well that in this our our country we are quite political. You don't want to quantify the impact that had on the patronage of Costa and Campo, you know, product. Let me just confess to you, you know, that in the early part, I love big lemon plots, I love plain goods, you know, and those are those are Costa and Campo, you know, product. For some time I was like, oh God, no more plain goods. No more, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, what they call big level pots, and they had many products. You know, their sanitary parts were very, were very good and effective, and so many other products. It was later on that we got to know that it was just a war of the marketplace, a war among the banks. And what did you know, folks and gamble do? They came, went to the MFF, the big public, and said, "No, you can see on the shelf, we are not, you know, in the shot of the devil and all of that." And then before we got down, and they are, they are, they are doing well in the, in the market, and in the Nigerian market. So that's what the reputational risk is. At the point in time, they said, Indomie. If you eat Indomie, you die. I, I didn't confirm, 
maybe somebody actually gets and dies, or something, something you know, fortunate happens about eating it. But some people use this as an advantage. And so between you and I, because I don't know who is who in my audience, we got to know who the gladiator, you know, of that story was to prevent them, you know, from continuing to be the market leader. That's the impact image of you in the market you can have, you know, on your personal and by consequence, on your bottom line. Okay, then secondly is, is competition risk. You also cannot take this for granted. This, you know, refers to the possibility of your company being affected by the activities of your competitors. And without wanting to waste time, I just use the old conservative you know, conventional example of uh, the, the service providers, the, 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 uh, the network and the communication company. You know, when Airtel and, and MCN first came, they came and sold per minute to us, such that even if you pick a call by one person, so they will take off the money, you know, for one minute from you. When Glow wanted to penetrate that market, they looked at it and said, how do we introduce ourselves? They looked at the old operations and said, okay, we take advantage. So they introduced a second. Now, our competition will come in. Imagine if in that particular year, uh, uh, MTN or the then, the Econet, they used to be also. The then Econet has made projection, revenue projection, based on per minute billing. And then from nowhere, Flow came into the market and it produced per second. And they were threatening, not even to just deplete their bottom line, they were threatening to, to, to steal some of their customers because many people wanted to port oh, per second. Now, at that point in time, for people that were already known with their MTM bank, they also have been flow. So, what I'm trying to say is that you can see the impact you know, of, of, of the activities of your competitor on their business. Another example is phone. I'm sorry if I say Sajem now, Nokia 70, I'm forgetting that old, very popular Nokia, before Nokia bounced back, you know, again. Sajem, Motorola, and all of that. The introduction of Blackberry killed their career. I'm sure that if a lot of them had those one billion being, you know, shipped to Africa, introduction of Blackberry just killed the career. And then look at Blackberry as well. Uh, 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 iOS, that's uh, Apple and Android as well, just made it a mess of them. So what I'm trying to say in essence is that competitors, your competitors are working and you cannot control it, you know, so there's a risk of their activity impacting, you know, on your own activity and then impacting on your own ability to achieve your objective. So you got to constantly be on the loop. Then of course, environmental activity uh, uh, you know, environmental factors are impact on the business. You know, environmental factors, you know, such as political factors, you know, economic factors, you know, social factors, technological factors, ecological factors, legal factors, and all of that. You know, I mean, one government policy, you know, we just, we just make a mess. You know, since 2015, I just said, you know, without fear and then without prejudice, I just said that, uh, you know, a lot of businesses, you know, have not been the same because of our foreign exchange policy. It's just been a tough. I have asked clients that said, look, look, man, you know, let's leave the Nigerian market and then just move to other things. Because we're producing, you know, from Malaysia, you know, and then putting it to Nigeria. And then the exchange got crazy. And we have competitors, you know, who are here. No matter what, it cannot be as bad as when you have raw material. And you are and you are producing. It cannot be as bad as it, it is to somebody who is producing, you know, a foreign currency and bring it here. The price will be too much as, as far as it will be on the other. So those are environmental factors. Then you have you know financial you know factors. These are these are uh, uh you know uh uh you know macroeconomic interest, you know, such as such as inflation, such as interest rates, you know, such as exchange rates and all of that, you know, that could impact, you know, the ability, 
you know, of the company to constantly meet its financial objectives. So you ought to, you know, ought to be on the lookout for that. Then you have liquidity risk. You know, liquidity risk is the risk, you know, of the company not having solved, not being solvent enough to meet obligations that are twenty. You know, so this, you know, comes, you know, from from uh, 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 what do you call from, uh, you know, factor that. You know, money in circulation and, and, and all of that. The company needs to position itself. You know, business bids are also called strategic bids because you cannot fully control them. You can only position yourself. I mean, we all do thumbs up to Goldman Sachs today because in the economic crunch there in America, Goldman Sachs, you know, and its analysts who, you know, they were among the biggest hit on the Wall Street. You know, why? Because you know, some of their analysts could see the future as they were positioning. Uh, Mary Lynch is a bank in America as well. They had an ex wild you know, risk manager who had predicted June, if nothing was done. He was not listening to because Mary Lynch was such a big bank. You know, when, you know, the June finally came, that guy was being, you know, you know, was, was a hot case, you know, by different companies. Because what do you see, you know, that all of us didn't see? And the last thing is like, you know, so what you can do as an organization now, because we're talking about holistic management of risk, you can position yourself, you know, for minimal negative effects, you know, for, for business risk, because you can't totally stop it. Then you have internal risk, you know, one is compliance. I'm not going to dwell so much on it. Compliance, you know, is the risk of sanction. When you don't adhere to rules, to regulations, to laws, to specifications. And I like putting specifications because uh, we tend to look at compliance only from the perspective of adhering to rules and regulation authority. If you don't dare to mess with your customer, permit you know my, 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 the use of my language. You don't mess with your customer because if you have a brand promise, because the customer are interested in something, they're interested in quality, they're interested in pricing, they don't even mind. Pay a little, they want to pay the, the lowest possible, but they don't mind sometimes to pay a little, you know, higher. But when you give them a bank promise and your specification, you know, is with you, you stand the risk of losing those customers. So anytime I'm talking about compliance, I always dare, and I'm talking to risk managers, I always dare to include the specification. Apart from, you know, uh, fine from, 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 from authorities such as SOM. Uh, uh, you know, ISO globally and all of that. How about the people you are dealing with? People that want to patronize you. Your product becomes worth it or reduced in quality such that they cannot divide their desired utility from your product. You are going to lose them. That is even a bigger fine you know, than, the, than the sanction that the authority will give. So they come back to that. Then you have operational, uh, you know, risk. Operational risk, you know, uh, are occasioned by something going wrong in the, in the internal process. In the internal process, you know, of the company and they cause things such as machine breakdown. You know, things such as, such as, you know, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 what do they call it now? A kind of staff that is, that is, you know, that is bitter. I'm, I'm using, for, I'm looking for the word, you know, for a negative, negative attitude, you know, of, Human resources, you know, machine breakdown. Just because somebody somewhere was not maintaining, just because somebody somewhere was not training, right? You know, poor quality, you know, human resources. You know, these are risks. Because uh, why this is a risk is that sometimes I'm sure you heard this saying that the culture is strategy for breakfast. So if at the top you have thought out, you know, your strategy, you thought out how to achieve your objective, and that thing is not cascaded down. Mentally, you know, to be good soldiers, they are the ones that will really help you. It's not even competition. Then we have finance. You know, this is the risk, uh, you know, of of negative effects of perhaps poor accounting or inaccurate financial records, uh, you know, in the system. So that's that for internal risk. Then, uh, I said because we are talking from the government, so you have governance risk, you know, as well, and this governance risk. Is extremely important and hinged to sustainability. Uh, because when the governance structure is bad, 
that there's nothing the genius in town can do. And that's why you see that anytime there's going to be a regulatory swing in any industry, check it out, banking, whatever industry where you've seen a lot of reform, they sweep away the, the board. Because if it is bad with the head, which is bad with the leadership, then the followership, you know, don't have the choice. They are the mercy of the leadership. And then we all play one day. We are also praying you know, that God has mercy on our nation and we all do what we have to do sometimes. You know, to do something about leadership is it's a big disgrace, it's a big burden, you know, it's a big uh you know shame to the nation. A nation like people like you, if I start taking your four pounds now, I'll see a lot of you know Oxford, Spain, you know, whatever. And 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 then what lineage and back. What organization has so you can see why there is that particular in our nation. If the leadership gets right, my God's grace, with the potentials of the human resources, even if all we have, you know, nobody's looking at our human resources, they think oil is all we have. We can, you know, thrive you know, on human resources. I dare to say that Nigeria can compete with it or with, or with any organization in human resources and their statistics, you know, no quality, you know, to show them. A solid, no leadership, so we are still suffering. So, governance is governance base is associated in the risk of poor governance, and there are elements of that governance that are pointed out. Number one is structure. If there isn't a proper structure, you know, in the governance, uh, uh, you know, cadre or in the governance organ of the entities, then something goes wrong. You know, you don't have defined committees, you don't, you, you have the same, the same. Person as chairman being the MD, you know, if there's no structure, you know, uh, uh, dominant personality to evolve, and there will be no order at all. Uh, then, then governance process. What are the processes? I'm not talking of personal process now. What are the processes, you know, that, that support and enhance smooth running of decision making? Smooth running, you know, of 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 personal of personal, you know, functioning of the board. You know, so there's got to be, you know, proper process. When uh, do you send information? Imagine uh, if you have to make a decision today and you are seeing all of the board back for the first time, today. you're not going to make quality decisions. So, what process do you use to drive that? Such that uh, 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 seven, seven days, two weeks before the board meeting, you know, and then in this current day, you know, as well, do you, do you still use paper such that your driver? driving all around 8, 9 p.m., 12 p.m. to look for one director to come Or you've done electronic. You understand? You've got electronic where each director can access, you know, remotely, board papers, digest it, and be well equipped, you know, for the decision, you know, that will be, that will be made at the bank table during the board meeting. Okay, so that's that. Then information as well. Information, and this is very key. And this is where I hope there is a lot of competitiveness there. This is where you need to play a role. The integrity of your information, the quality of your information will determine the quality of, of the decision. No matter how brilliant the board members are, it's a garbage in, garbage out there. You know, so there's a risk. If there isn't a mechanism, if there isn't a mechanism in place in the company to ensure that the system turns out credible information, Quality information. That there's going to be a problem in the decision making, and that will be a governance of, of you know problem. If things are happening, and the MD and the ED they have a way of hiding it, just because they don't want immediate review of the board, and then the board is not kept in the know of reality, and the board is busy using all their acumen, all their experience to make decisions, you know, on the wrong, you know, whatever. So something goes wrong. Then of course people and culture. You know, as well, people and culture, uh, you know, as well. This is where the issue of, you know, all good behavior comes in. What is the quality of the director of the operation involved? What is the appropriateness of the business of the director of the operation involved? If you have the wrong people, for example, you and I, you know, let's, 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 let's think of it. I have by our training, by our authorization. You can't be in a place. You, you are not delivering, and then you are just chopping on. 
and then your conscience is clear. Okay, and don't have government chairman or some some position holders like Babu, my government allocation from my compact, share it. Your training do not permit you. Either religious training or your professional training. Even if there is a high level of carefulness in you, by, by, by your training, you cannot totally be like that. But we have, you know, such in governance entities, especially public sector entities, where uh, appointment into the governance organ is by political consideration. You now see people who don't have anything on set, tearing the ship and, and, and turning out policies, you know, for Harvard graduates, for Oxford graduates. This can be right. Something with you know, so that's that for you know, the, the category you know, of this. Just to be sure that you are with me, can we quickly do an, an exercise? The exercise for you in one second. Let, let me bring you back. In one second, can you tell me you know, how many horses? Can you see the screen? Can you tell me how many horses uh, you know, have been like in what is before you? The first person to get it. I'll clap on the person. Okay. Quickly say three. Any other person? Victoria says one. Other people are sleeping, right? That's why you're not participating. Can we have more people? So I know that you are still awake, you're not sleeping. Okay, Gibara says three. Ah, Charles says 12. <laughs> okay, Pukala James says 5. Okay, so Pukala James has got it. There are 5. You know, there are 5 horses with 3 legs. So Pukala James, I clap for you. And I give you presidential handshake to receive it you know, in good life. You know, so there are, five, there are 5 horses. I just said that, you know, to, to confirm that they're still with me. So let's move on. Okay, so let's talk about risk management. We're moving for me now. First aspect, you know, of our of our topic. So risk management, uh, and then out of all of the definition, I, I particularly like you know the definition by the Cadbury Code. You know, that the, the Cadbury Committee report. Okay, so it says that risk management is is a is a is a process by which the executive under the supervision, you know, of the board, what do they do? They identify risk, and then they establish priorities for control and particular objectives. Do you see our definition of risk appetite? We donate them. Okay, so the management under the supervision of the board, what do they do? They try to identify the risk that the board contains. Then they try to establish priorities for control. So exactly what you're doing when you're defining your risk appetite. You're, you're defining priorities. Is this what we want to accept? Is this, even though this is our capacity, this is what we have we have preference for, you know, so that you know we establish priorities, you know, both for control and then for achievement of you know objectives. Okay, so who's responsible as well, you know, for risk management? Ultimate responsibility is to the board. The board has ultimate responsibility for establishing an effective and a workable risk management framework. However, other people take part. The executives implement whatever has been decided. The risk appetite is decided at the top, the governing organ, the board. Now, the management expedites action. The management, um, you know, uh, executes whatever has been decided by the government uh, organ. So, responsibility ultimately, or responsibility, responsibility generally is a joint thing. That's the ultimate responsibility. Something goes wrong. And this, you know, crystallizes, and the company goes under. The first point of them is due to the board. And that's why the board has the responsibility 
set up a framework, set up a mechanism, you know, to fish out, you know, the bad eggs. Before the bad eggs, you know, allow the decay, you know, to get to them. Okay, so enterprise risk management, you know, following into a destination. I said that risk basically uh, is related. If you look at those categories of risk that we look at, you see some level of interrelatedness. You know, that's the, that's the, that's the justification or an holistic uh, you know, framework to manage all the risks you know, that the company is exposed to. That is the justification you know, for, the, for the co-founder of enterprise you know, risk management. The justification is the fact that risks are interrelated and the need to be managed comprehensively and holistically. <clears throat> now, another exercise. <clears throat> Do you agree with Warren Buffett? Warren Buffett says, uh, you know, that <coughs> risk comes from not knowing what you're doing. Can I get, can I get, you know, do you agree with him? Can I get some responses in, 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 the, in the chat? A few people. Do you agree with Warren Buffett that risk comes from you not knowing what, what you're doing? Okay. Color change four. I agree. That's our price winner for the other exercise. Thank you, Color. Okay, so any other person? Okay, 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 okay. Thank you, thank you. So I guess, I guess, you know, that we get the perspective, you know, that what Google was coming from. What one Google is saying is that, you know, the crystallizing and the negative effect of this comes, you know, from not knowing what you're doing. If you look at what we have been saying, you know, since morning. If you set up a, a, a mechanism, a framework, you know, to identify, to define, you know, what your objectives are and all of that, then you will not totally be at loss, even when this, you know, crystallizes. Okay, so one of the subjects, okay, okay, we can say one of the subjects, uh, you know, of this. Thank you very much, you know, for those that are participating and making the class not to be a one-sided thing. So enterprise risk management is all about time. You know, so it's a process. Another place I want to dissect, you know, so enterprise risk management basically, you know, is a process. It is affected by the board. I mean, we already established responsibility. It is affected, let me check my time. It is affected, you know, you know, by the board of directors in conjunction with management and other personnel of the company. Huh? And then it is applied in strategy setting. And across board, across the enterprise. And basically, it is designed, you know, to identify potential events that may affect the entity. And then it's aimed at managing the risk within the risk appetite. And then to provide reasonable assurance, you know, that the company is able and capable to achieve its objective. So you can see. You know that uh, enterprise risk management encapsulates all that we've been saying so far. You know, so essentially, it is a process established, you know, by the board, of course, with input carrying along management and other personnel. What makes you know enterprise risk management model? It's just it's just one of the models. Do you understand of risk management? You know, it's just it's just a, a one of the models and then. There have been, uh, you know, a lot of authorities, global authorities, that have made their contribution to this concept, to this model, you know, of risk management. COSO is one of them. ISO, you know, is one of them, and so on, you know, and so forth. That have made their contribution and have contributed their thoughts, you know, in, in enhancing in the involvement of this model, this particular model, called, you know, ERW. Okay, so ERW, you know, from COSO's, you know, definition. The integrated framework of 2004 says it is a process. You know, Cadbury also defined it, uh, you know, as a process. So risk management basically is a process. You know, so it's a process of affecting, uh, 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 what do they call it? Affected, uh, you know, by the management and the board and all of that. And it is applied in a strategy, you know, set. What I like about ERM is that in other words, every other activities, that the company embarked upon 
is tested to the litmus, you know, test, you know, of of risk framework, even to the extent of strategy setting. And that's why, you know, the process is expected in strategy, uh, you know, setting. And this picture next just, 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 you know, summarizes what I'm saying. You understand what I'm saying? So you have, you know, your risk, uh, you know, management, and every other thing you do, your intention, your objective, your strategy setting, you subject them, you know, to that litmus test, you know, of the risk management framework to determine whatever your direction is, you know, that time. Okay, so uh, the, the, the definition, some of the things that I stress, uh, you know, I just listed them, you know, out there, you know, for easy understanding. I said that it's a process, which means that it is ongoing. The process, you know, is an ongoing thing. I said it is effective, you know, so that means there are responsibilities, you know, for risk for ERM. Then I said that it is applied in strategy setting. So, uh, there's consciousness as well about achievement, about performance, you know, in here. Then I said it across the organization, the board, the management, other personnel. Unlike some other models where you just set it and people don't come. The ERM, you know, in ERM, it's constant across every cadre of the organization. And it's designed to identify events as, as inherent in the definition of council. By the way, council is committee of sponsoring organizations. Committee of Sponsoring Organizations. It's an American-based, uh, you know, organization dedicated, you know, uh, to advocacy, you know, for proper risk management. So, Committee of Sponsoring Organizations. So, uh, it is it provides reasonable assurance. ERM provides reasonable assurance, you know, to step forward, and then of course it's geared towards the achievement of the corporate, you know, objective. Uh, there's something about responsibility to play as the board has a, has a role to play. We know that they are the ultimate direct, direction setter. The CEO has a role to play. Uh, you know, the ERM or risk committee, as the case may be, then you have the chief risk uh, you know, uh, officer, and then you have risk owners. Who are the operators? Who are the people that help to identify what could go wrong on the day-to-day -day running of the company's you know, activity? Okay? So I'm also watching my time. Uh, so what are the objectives uh, you know, of ERM? Objectives you know, of ERM. Number one, you know, is risk oversight. ERM aims at ensuring that no risk inherent in the company's activity goes unnoticed or unattended to. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, a decision will be made, uh, and that's where, uh, uh, you know, uh, the risk appetite thing, the, the concept of risk, risk appetite and, and, and all of that, the justification for it comes in. Comes you know, to play. But as far as ERM is concerned, there is no, there is nothing, no event that will affect the company that goes unnoticed, you know, or talked about. That's what the framework, that's what you know, the <clears throat> the, the mechanism, you know, aims at doing. Then of course ownership and responsibility, like I said, there are people who are responsible to play different roles. Then it provides assurance. It's aimed at providing assurance, you know, for, for uh, 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 for, for various stakeholders, and look, the company has the capacity to achieve its objective. And of course, uh, because it cuts across boards, it involves all cadres, you know, of, of stakeholders, internal stakeholders within the company. It creates awareness. At the low level, the low level staff are not saying they don't know what it is. You know, so it creates, you know, some form of, uh, you know, awareness. And then, it enhances effectiveness. Why? Because ERM, we we'll look at the process shortly. ERM, you know, by its framework, you know, as an element for constant monitoring and review. You know, so what that does is that it promotes and enhances, uh, you know, effectiveness. Okay, so I just have some dimensions actually. Uh, we could say uh, good practices or best practices as far as ERM, you know, is concerned. Okay, so one of such, you know, concepts is risk, transparency, and insight. Uh, of course, to ensure risk, transparency, and insight, you need to ensure, you know, that there's adequate risk impact estimation. I will not dwell on that. We'll talk about this process shortly. When we're talking about risk uh, assessment, we'll make mention of this. Then you, you, it, it helps, you know, you should ensure that there's performance, you know, regulation, 
of calibration, you know, across businesses. That's why I told you that no risk goes on top. No risk, you know, goes on notice. You may not decide, you know, your level of acceptance or the why, but no risk. By, by nature of risk, enterprise risk management, no risk, uh, you know, within or outside the company should go on notice or on identified. Then you look beyond likelihood of impact, ensure that you have insight into priority, and then you cascade risk you know, report to all levels. We talk about risk reporting, you know, subsequently very short. Then risk appetite and strategy, you know, get, you know, clear definition of what your risk appetite is. This is just like, you know, emphasizing some of the things that are said, uh, uh, you know, under this head. Then you formulate strategies, you know, informed by risk. And that was why I said that the unique thing about ERM is the fact that every of your activity is risk considered. You want to move, you want to sneeze, it's risk, you know, considered. So if, 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 you, if you adopt, you know, an ERM, every activity you understand of yours is subjected to the risk monster. You want to invest, you want to spend, so you are risk conscious. It creates, you know, risk consciousness, uh, you know, not fear, risk consciousness, you know, at all. So you formulate strategy informed, you know, by risk insight. Okay, then. Uh, for which related business processes, you ensure that managerial decision, you know, embeds, uh, you know, in risk in the risk process. Then you ensure that you establish strong links, you know, between ERM functions and business uh, you know, units. Uh, for which organization and governance, adopt organizational models tailored towards your particular business requirement, and then ensure adequate resource, uh, uh, you know, at all levels, you know, to manage it. The risk culture, ensure that you align your culture, your risk culture, you know, with strategy, as we already said, you know, earlier. So what are some of the benefits of ERM? I'll just go through them. You have this in your notes, uh, you know, in the slide. If you increase possibilities of achieving corporate objectives, I mean, that's a given. It reduces, you know, variability, you know. Then there's proactive identification and management of risk, enterprise wide entity wise, like I was saying before, it improves the governance process. I mean, uh, you know, if you, I mean, especially with that introduction of me, you know, putting governance in, it, it helps governance process. It increases positive outcomes as an advantage, that's a given. It improves stakeholder confidence, that's a given. It provides assurance to them. It improves operational effectiveness. It improves resource deployment, that's a right. And then it enhances organizational points, you know, and resilience. That's what every risk management framework you know, should do. It should enhance organizational choice, you know, and resilience. So let's take a look at the risk process or element. I told you that risk management is a process. You understand. And then the the the, the chronological sequence, you know, is what defines well the content, you know, of risk management. So for enterprise risk management, once again, as outlined by couple, uh, you know, this is in your notes, you know, as well. Uh, uh, you know. So you have your internal environment, you should have, you know, an environment. What that interest is the mental attitude. Do you understand? It's the culture, the mental attitude, you know, to, to risk is from management, you know, to digital management, to goal style. Are you carefree? You know, about events that could affect, you know, the company. So there's, there's got to be an orientation. There's got to be an acculturization, you know, essentially. You know, so that internal, you know, environment, attitude of the internal stakeholders to risk, you know, for due to establish an effective risk management. There should also be objective testing, you know, like I said, there should be, uh, you know, event identification. In other words, uh, there should be, uh, you know, a mechanism to identify, you know, risk. Do you understand? Know there should be risk assessment. I mean, I give you an example uh, because it, it's over a year now that it's been a, it's been a digital world. You understand? Know so naturally now, because of experiences, because of various, uh, you know, experiences, when you want to hold a virtual, uh, you know, session like this, you have like you have smile, you have, uh, uh, you have stream, you have spec panel. Then you have your phone, whatever, so that all of them are functioning the way at any point and because of disappointment, you know, that has been uh, experienced. Of course, you know, you can't go down the fact that sometimes weather 
you know, weather just, you know, everything just affects, uh, you know. But what I'm trying to say, you know, here is that, you know, because everybody has been doing this over and over again, that exposes us to identify what could go wrong. You know, so also in an NPC, there should be a mechanism for event identification or risk identification. Then there should be a mechanism for risk assessment. You know, we we'll talked about that shortly. Then you should have a mechanism for risk response. And that's the reason why, you know, we'll be ending this our discussion by talking about business continuity plan. You got to have, you know, a mechanism to respond to risk, not only to, to identify it, not only to assess it, the impact and all of that, you should be able to respond to it. Because your response will determine whether you survive or you will, you will be consumed, you know, by the crystallization, you know, of those risks. And then you have control activity, you know, you know, measures, you know, put in place. And then you have information and communication, which is very key, extremely key, you know, as well. And you have monitoring, like I told you, you know, earlier, monitoring, you know, reviewing and all of that. So this is just that, you know, put at a glance. So let's look at one or two of that process, risk identification. You've got to be able to identify risk. How do you go about identifying Risk. One of the methodologies, one of the tools is mind map. Where you just you just you just think through that what could go wrong, what has gone wrong in the past, you know, and you start you start brainstorming so to say, and then you start you start you know noting them down. You understand? That. Another thing is process mapping. This is our process. After this, 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 after this, if this person doesn't come, if this person you know falls sick, if this machine gets caught. What that does to you is that in considering your processes, you are able to identify what could go wrong and those constitute risk. You know them that. You know there's stress testing. Stress testing and just being fast because uh, we have less than 30 minutes. You know, we have you know lots of testing. And I don't want them to lose me out. Okay, so stress testing. Stress testing is like sensitivity analysis where you simulate possible occurrences and then you try you know to plug in your current capacity to see how you will fare in the event of that simulated situation. I'll come make it. First testing is when you simulate occurrence. You simulate the situation. You understand what I'm saying. And then you now try, you know, in that simulated you know situation, you now plug in your current capacity to see how you will fight. That will be a pointer, you know, to how you can exist or go under in the event of an account. That's first step. Then you have strategic documents. You know, documents that you know business impact studies. When I mean when you are when you are writing your business continuity plan, you know, there will always be business impact analysis. So such, such documents, you know, help you to look to see what you know your your business possible risk to be they are expert to cost, you know, uh, uh you know, they are expert to cost, you know, that make projections of what risk you will face in this quarter, in that quarter, uh, you know, we have goal of statistics, you know, again, like so such about they are researchers, you know, they are questionnaires, you know, that will be used. So all of this, you know, you get an impulse and identify what to go on. So these are ways, you know, of identifying who to make different. And that's why I said that. By the approach of ERM, no risk to go unidentified or unnoticed. Okay, so let me quickly also give you a test. You know, are you there? Be sure you are there. So the question says, which is best? Let me get your feedback and see how you. Okay, well, the successful often I will get to themselves, voting by selling the rest of us. Voting is not right because this starts from where you do not have the fact. So ignorance is a vital thing. Okay, I get your point. You know, you can trickle, you know, about what worry, you know, was said. But I guess I have defined, you know, the perspective. You understand? Even though he used the word risk, you know, generically, he used the word risk generically. But what he was referring to was colossal loss. Do you understand? In the crystallization of risk is when you don't know what you're doing because you are expected. So I'm prepared, you know, for this. So I, I, I hope you get the perspective. Okay, so, okay, so Keith Elamor says, 
yellow is red, okay? In terms of shape, the middle circle is red, okay? I like that. If I like that, another one says yellow is red, okay? Okay. Another person says, uh, another person says yellow, okay? Who's on mark? Uh, Hartley says yellow, okay? Uh, that was not supposed to be a scissor. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, you know, that was, a, that was supposed to just be a, 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 a scissor, you know, to prompt you, you know, to think out of the box. Such that when you want to, when you want to identify this, I mean, I just talked about mind mapping, process mapping, and all of that. Think outside the box. It is only when you think outside the box, you know, that you will be guaranteed of identifying and ensuring that no risk in whatever quantum in whatever level goes on notice. So thank you to all of those people, you know, who participate, you know, who participated, uh, you know, thank you very much uh, for that. So, so risk assessment. Risk assessment basically is uh, one of the process of risk management. So, so it, is, it, is, it entails you, uh, after identifying you know, the risk, for each of the risks, we are now, we are now trying to ascertain what is the impact it will have on your business? And number one, what is the possibility of it crystallizing? If it crystallizes, what will be the impact, you know, on your business? And that's why, you know, some of the tools that you use, you know, for risk, you know, assessment that are put on your screen, you have hazard spotting. You want to spot the danger, you know, in it. Then you want to, you want to, for each of the dangers, what will be the effect on your business? You understand what I'm saying? Will it pumpu you within seconds? Will it will it give you time, you know, to recover? You need to be able to spot, you know, such possibilities. I mean, uh, the 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 entities, for example, that take reputational risk very seriously, they know the hazard characterization in image, in, in, in poor image. It could it could it could push. I mean, there have been events. Do you understand? There have been events. You know that makes the waiting of the public to go from here here. I remember when the issue about Tiger Tiger Woods and its infidelity to Joe Rogan as well. You realize that uh, uh, Accenture, a global consulting company, he was one of their ambassadors. Immediately they dissociated with him because that kind of activity, you know, portends great danger and hazard for their brand. So they act quickly make a statement. I'm sure there will be some understanding behind those of that look, you know, Tiger Woods, you know, this, 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 we wish you the best. But for continued sustainability, because the impact, you know, of reduced image of perception, nobody can quantify it. You know, so it depends. There are some companies, you know, that uh, even if, you know, they perceive them, you know, badly, they are full of people say, well, we hate what they have done. We, Blah blah blah. But this product is the only option we have, and it's too bad. So it is left for you to understand your business environment, your business situation, and then you know assess appropriately. And then of course there's exposure, you know, assessment. And then I put there, uh, you know, uh, a quadrant, which is a working tool. At any point of time that you are trying to assess this, you know, you have, uh, you know, uh, you know the impact, and then you have the likelihood. What is the likelihood, and what will be the impact? You know, so whatever your your position is here, that's what will determine you know your, your the measures that you put uh, you know, in place. Okay, so evaluating uh, you know risk, how often should you you know evaluate your risk your risk management process, your risk management process regularly, you know, quarterly on a quarterly you know, basis, but at least there should be an annual report. You know, to take hold of it. Okay, an annual risk assessment, evaluation of your risk, you know, management process to check it, to, uh, uh, you know, to check its its effectiveness. And there are even um, disclosure requirements, even with annual reports. For example, the internal control, you know, statement, the the audit committee, uh, you know, statement, even the auditor's opinion. These, you know, are are, are pointers. Do you understand? Risk assessment basically, and their disclosure requirements and their annual reports on account. Okay, so 
Maybe this should be our last activity for today. Don't worry, after this, I won't do any other activity with you. So can you spot the difference? I also want to, you know, check your ability to assess. Can you spot the difference here? In these three things in front of you. Any response? Cookie James, don't let me down. Any response from the house? What is the difference among the things? Okay, there's a circle on A. Thank you, Miriam. A is different to me below it. Thank you. Okay, so that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Please look at the center in A is different. Okay. Okay, A is different to Sarah James. Thank you. Okay, good one. Good one. At least it shows you with me. It shows you with me. Thank you very much. You know, for the for being interactive. Okay, so reporting to stakeholders. One of the key elements, you know, of of ERA is reporting to stakeholders. And what is the justification, you know, to report to stakeholders? And then when I'm talking about stakeholders, there's a wide spectrum of stakeholders you know, attached as far as the company is concerned. You have the yes, shareholders, you have of course, the directors, you have the management, you have the staff, you have suppliers. You have government, you have creditors, you have community, you have customers. You know, so you have, you know, a wide a spectrum, you know, of stakeholders. You must give a feedback to them. You know, that was why we said that, you know, an effective risk management framework should have as one of, you know, the elements information and communication. You understand? When you are when you are writing you, you know, your business or continuity plan, as a matter of fact, you will be expected. To assign responsibility. One of the responsibilities is in the event of crystallization, who communicates, who manages, you know, information. So also you have a responsibility as a government organ or as internal player to report, you know, with respect to this, to your spectrum, you know, of stakeholders. Okay, so what are some of the justification? Of course, there's growing requirements by regulators. You know, regulators who are monitoring your sustainability require it. And then demand from stakeholders, you know, for specific risk. I mean, ESG, uh, uh, you know, is that area that I don't start delving uh, you know, into. If you want to effectively manage your stakeholders, you report back to them. Then you have response to, doc, to, to, to governance crisis, corporate governance crisis, you know, to identify what went, what went on, and then you report to stakeholders. And of course, report in annual reports on uh, your know, account. Uh, so, what are some of the risks, some key risks, you know, that I think you should you know, pay attention to in, in our modern world, in our everyday world? One is cyber security, you know, cyber risk. You and I know that. Um, I mean, the other day I, I saw a broadcast, you know, a broadcast, you know, that says, uh, uh, it says uh, that some people got calls from some people that say this is your VPN. If you don't give some other information, you know, you will close your account. Somebody reported that from Echo Bank and from, from another bank. And so when they went to the bank, they said we didn't send anybody to call you. And when they called one of them, they realized that it was where they were doing uh, NIN registration. And you know, the form, they require you to show your VPN and then those guys, I don't know, I don't know them, they're careless with it and somebody got it. You and I know that these days, you know, if if they steal somebody's phone, your biggest worry, you know, is not the value of that phone. It is your SIM card. There are some whiz, whiz, you know, students that use that SIM card. As long as it is it is the SIM card linked to your baby, they use it to commit the so 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 we are we are we are in a cyber war. And then cyber risk uh, you know is extremely uh, you know, it's an extreme reality. So it's a risk to watch for. Then data protection, just like just like the example that I gave, you understand what I'm saying. Data protection, you know, people, people, right? For the people into doing, you are into data mining. You know, I mean, for all of us, I mean, a lot of governance practitioners are here, company secretaries, you know, expected to learn all of that, and then you want to manage uh, you know, data and all of that. Please. You know, the potential risk of you leaking out people's data and the liability that comes with it is a big deal. So we should, you know, ensure that, you know, not even in this era of our data protection regulation, you know, that gives certain rights, you know, 
and requires you to even get the content, you know, of your data content, you know, all of that. These are full subjects that I just, I just make mention of. I'm not talking about it. Like talent management, identity talent management. Uh, sometime last year in Africa, I went to get a session that day. Executives in the world were asking what the opinion was, you know, as to uh, artificial intelligence and what threat they pose to human beings. Of course, my ultimate answer was that artificial intelligence is not going to get to a point of clearing out, uh, you know, human effort. Let's face it, you understand? It will only reduce, you know, the quantum of human beings needed. They do not clear out. Artificial intelligence will not exist. You know, on their own. Well, to my mind, uh, you know, I'm entitled to an opinion. But what I'm, what I'm saying here is that in the event of you rationalizing, you understand, you know, there's a risk of various factors, you know, such as nepotism, you know, favoritism, and all of that, you know, that could push you not to even be able to identify the right talent, you know, the right, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, talent. And that's danger because the biggest assets, the biggest resource any entity can have is human resources. Having the right quality of human resources without sentiment, dispassionately, you know, identifying the right resources that will take you to El Dorado is a big goal. And it's a risk that many organizations are facing. In the event, in the realities of various, you know, affiliations and associations and all of that. But personally, you know, I don't make business with pressure. When it comes to sensitivity, you know, it's it. I'm privileged, you know, to, to, you know, to chair the legal state chapter. I'm the immediate, immediate chairman of the legal state chapter, you know, of the institute. And then I ran a structure where I had, you know, various committees. After the first year, it's a two year term. After the first year, in December, I reviewed everybody's activity. And there were certain positions that I reviewed against all odds. You know, but the result, you know, that followed justified my witness. And the people that I reviewed, you know, reviewed and changed are people that are close. So many people think, oh, this guy is, is emotionally, he does not have, you cannot be my sister, you cannot be my dear friend, you know, you are not producing results. What are we talking about? You understand? So I set up a framework to allow the best of the best to emerge and to the work. Simple. You know, so talent management risk is a key risk. You know, in the event of sentiment of un 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 unemployment, I don't want my cousin to be unemployed. So you continue to pack your, your, your cousin or your wife's cousin or your whatever, you know, and all of that. I'm currently in the middle of, you know, a, a, a recruitment, you know, for an automobile, you know, company. And I'm, of course, it's for the position of company tech speed, head of that. And then, you know, a lot of members of our institute, I met a lot of them, you know, in the interview, a lot of them that I knew because they didn't meet me until the interview. And some of them that have worked with me that are just close to passion. And it will not disturb our outside relationship. Because you need the right to you choose leaders, you choose employees by competence, by capacity, by ability to deliver, and not all other sentiments of you. You know, so talent management is a key risk to survival, to sustainability, you know, in a company. Then you have third party, you know. There are a lot of a lot of outsourcing, you know, in these modern times. You know, a lot of you know outsourcing, and there's a risk, you know, in that a risk of your of your sensitive, you know, strategies, your sensitive, you know, information, you know, your sensitive intelligence as an organization, third party to be exposed to it by virtue of the role they are playing for you. So you got to manage that right. You know, using such things as MOUs, such things as SLA, such things as if there are stronger agreements, you know, and all of that. I mean, IT guys have access to you. So, uh, uh, I have an IT consultant, you know, who comes to service. He just finished servicing all the systems in my office, you know, last week. You understand? I want to install something. So, he carries the laptop and he's working on it, you know, and all of that. You don't know what. You know, so for such, you know, you have an SLA from, you know, to manage the relationship and the potential risk so that if anything, you know, from your system is divorced from anywhere, if you know the assignment, of course, 
We are Africans, so you cannot go out religion and believe in God for all. There's that part of may God never let us have that place. You know, let there be some, some, some black and white, you know, contract and document, you know, to avoid that. But that that's going to be, uh, you know, a risk. You understand what I'm saying? That, uh, you know, there is a lot of modern day something, you know, we create by virtue of the, the business model of our person, you know, this way. Thank you. Then, then you have. You know, business continuity and crisis response. We'll talk about that in a short event. You know, data and new technology. You have the risk of new technology. I mean, uh, let me let me let me say uh, you say to you that I have quite a number of systems, you know, in my office. And then Ethan sent me a mail yesterday. Said, yes, they want to standardize. So if you're going to be facilitating for that, you got to you have an approved uh background or whatever they call it you know so that i'm not putting my company you know um, apart. and out of the the three systems that laptops are part of it's only one you know that has you know the configuration fit into that and that's the one this is not my favorite laptop that i'm using you know but it's the one with the capacity and specification you know to be able to meet up with the specification of people so what I'm trying to say is that if this specification becomes the norm for all my businesses, what that means, you know, is that all the other two laptops I use are now useless for me. I give you an example. Just early last year or so, Microsoft phased out servicing of you know Microsoft Seven. Uh, they are uh, uh, MS Seven. Do you know whatever they call it? You understand what I'm saying? Out to seven, whatever it is. You know. So what that means is that if you have a system, you know, that still has the operating uh, uh, you know, system as Windows Seven, so yes, Windows Seven, it is no more supported. There are no more support. You understand? Uh, you know, for it. So what I'm trying to bring out of that is that technology is evolving, and the risk and, and then it's evolving and it requires a lot of a lot of you know investment. Do you get what I'm saying? So ability, you know, to be well calculated. Just as you are importing, you know, and you are installing more technology, you know, another one is coming. You know, uh, so that's going to pose, you know, a lot of exposure, you know, to liquidity management. And then as well, uh, 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 you know, ability of the company to meet up, uh, you know, with current reality. You know, so technology, the risk of you know, the turn out of technology is an area as well that a serial minded organization should constantly, you know, look at. If you are going to be doing it face by face, you know, such that such a new technology comes out, let this aspect of the business, you know, rather than phase out all other, so that as, as new ones are evolving, you are putting, you know, some old ones, some new ones, so that you don't go all investment in one, and then by next year, you have to fix out all of that investment and have another huge capital intensive you know, investment. You know, it requires a lot of a lot of calibration, mental calibration, you know, to really get it, you know, appropriately you know, right. And of course, culture. Culture, you know, is a big thing. I just did say to you, culture is a mental and it is it's norm. It's the way we do things around uh, you know, here, like I put you know it's not it's it's a killer of studies. As it is said in governance setting, you know, the governance is so culture is strategic of Christmas. If the attitude is not right, if the way we do things around the economy, it is a very great risk, a potential hazard, you know, to the ability of the company to achieve its corporate objectives. I'll leave that at that, you know, because of our time. I told you I'm conscious. Then we have board information. I already explained about board information earlier, so I'm not going to I'm not going to, you know, overbeat it. Now we live, you know, in a cyber world. And I just put some some some, some realities before you. Use of internet. You now have 3.4 billion internet users globally. You now have 8.8.4 billion connected devices on the internet. You now have 47 billion e-commerce transactions annually. 94% of businesses with 10 employees are online. 2 million you know, petabytes of internet traffic as of 2019. I don't know the current thing. So, so what I'm trying to say with all of these you know, statistics, there's 
cyber cyber incident. Forty-four increase in cyber incident. You know, thirty-one point one, thirty-one point five million new malware samples. Now, what I'm saying with all of this is that we now live in a world out of all of those things you know that I talked about. You know, cyber risk is a key thing that I want to emphasize for all of you risk managers, all of you governance practitioners. You know, to pay a lot of attention. Uh, you know, too. Uh, uh, because of time, I won't go into you know these examples. But you know, we have you know EPP. You know, uh, even even Yahoo. There was there was data breach. You know, that's a compromise in Yahoo, and then that brought a lot of liability. You know, if it was data breach, you know, we had first American fight. You know, there there was there was an access into their system, and then people details, client details, you know, were accessed. That just to show you the reality of our world. And then on individual, uh, uh, you know, level, you have a lot of a lot of things, you know, that happen. You know, you know, smishing that people sending you, uh, uh, what do they call it now? You know, phishing, phishing, the one that I said, I said earlier that anonymous people that have access to information and give you, you know, some random calls and then they give you information about it. And then that that overwhelms you. Before you know it, you, you are probably if you don't have, you know, file knowledge, you understand. You are probably giving out information, people to give it out. You understand. They're phishing. You know that has to do with, uh, uh, with you know, the net. You have, uh, uh, you know, smishing, which is false SMS. I mean, there are some there are some SMS that you, you will see. Somebody was making my session on one GTP now. There's a way to see device that you see. They will receive some, you know, some SMS that they will try as much as possible, as possible to, to, to clone, you know, how even GTP or any of those banks, you know, appear. It will take, you know, good insight, you know, for you to know that this is not a GTP, you know, by GTP. But the essence of saying all of this is to bring our attention to the fact that a lot of cyber crime, you know, around us and then we need to pay attention you know, to it. And then, uh, of course, uh, who as well, WHO, I saw this on the website, you know, where they were also trying to, uh, you know, allude to the fact that there's a lot of cyber crime, you know, and then they warn people, you know, against hackers, you know, and all of that. And then, what I wanted to bring up on, what I want to bring up for you from this slide, you know, where I said the World Health Organization will never ask for your username or password to access safety information. Hardly will any organization do that. So take note of that. They will never email attachment you didn't ask for. Take note of that. You know, they will never ask you to, to, to visit a link outside their website. You understand? Or outside their web mode of you know communication with you. And this as well. I use WHO, you know, to defeat all of our organizations. Just take note of the things, you know, that WHO says they will never ask people. Most of you will never ask people, so don't fall, you know, prey to some of these scams. Okay, so having said that, the five minutes left are not uh, business of this grant. You know, so basically, in a layman language, you know, a business continuity plan is a plan, a contingency plan, you know, that is put in place in the event of disaster in your business to to help your business to recover and continue, you know, to exist. There's a little thin line, you know, on space, what they call it, a business continuity plan, uh, you know, and disaster recovery plan. Yes, they are close, you know, but a business continuity plan is like an advanced level of disaster recovery plan. For disaster recovery plan, it helps you to quickly recover back to normal. A business continuity plan focuses beyond just helping you to quickly bounce back to normal, you know, but it also enhances continued smooth flow, you know, of your operations after recovery, you know, from the disaster, from the unforeseen or foretold, uh, you know, disaster. Okay, so I also, you know, put this in a different way, you know, to say the process of creating a system of prevention and recovery from potential threats and loss. It ensures that assets and personnel are protected and are able to function quickly in the event of a disaster. So when you are creating a business continuity you know, plan, uh, you know, I just put I just I just put you know a not cast stone you know set of considerations. 
you ensure that you identify the objective of the plan and you set goals. You choose what the business continuity plan team will be. I use the, the entity issue you know, as an example. You understand what the objective of the team. Then you conduct a business impact analysis that I mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier. Identify key business areas and critical functions. You know, those are your focus uh, you know, areas that if anything goes you know, bad for your company, it could be the data, for another company, it could be the machine, for another company, it could be the personnel. Identify you know, critical functions in your business, then identify the pain points. Do you understand? You know, the weak, the weak points, the, the, the weak, the weak points, that's the dependency. Then you create steps to maintain you know, operations. Like, okay, if this happens, what are the steps you know, to take in? Then you develop a testing and training curriculum. Then you determine you know, ongoing you know, programs. Why you are choosing your, your team, you, you pick goals. You, know, you identify who will be the information giver you know, and who, 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 who will update you know, the public or various stakeholders about the turnout of events. Okay, then the scope of business continuity plan. Just one more slide. You know, if that's that, so what's the scope? You know, so the scope. Uh, so what you have before you have used a concept you know in economy that they call the six capital model. You know, because we are talking about sustainability. You know, the six capital model is used to depict you know sustainability. And how that would fall into value value. These are critical areas that produce value that enhance continued existence you know, of the company. So what this is saying here is that when you are Developing your know, business continuity plan. Let's, you know, your plan cover each of these four because these are the value producers inherent in your business. You know, so what what are financial capital? Financial capital, you know, are assets that can be used, you know, to acquire, uh, uh, you know, they are, they are assets that can be used to acquire other assets and produce value. For example, shares, cash. You use you use shares to buy stakes. Buy ownership stake, you know, in a company. You use cash to produce, to buy machinery, or you use to produce, you know, product. So, uh, you know, financial capital, you know, is is a key, you know, is a key value to sustainability. Then you have manufacturer capital. Manufacturer capital, you know, are the are the tools that you use for production to, to produce your offering or your value into the market. Then you have the human capital. I'm not going to say much about it. The human capital as the human being. Then you have the intellectual capital. The intellectual capital is where the generation of ideas. Generation of ideas. I talked about innovation. Without intellectual capital, there can't be innovation. You understand? Then you have the natural you know, capital. Everything that we can see, your system, your clothes, they all you know, were produced you know, from the natural or resources. Then you have social capital. Social capital has to do with relationships. Relationships, relationships, relationships. What uh, you know, protocol or, or procedure will achieve in five minutes? Relationship will achieve it in five minutes. And mind you, we as human beings are social beings. I don't want to say we are social animals. We are social beings. We thrive on relationships. So what I'm saying in essence is this: is that when you are developing your business continuity plan, let's eat cut across each of these. You know, capital. These capital that turn out value, that enhance sustainability. You know, for your business. Lastly, what are the benefits of you know uh, of business continuity plan? It helps you to establish trust. It builds reputation. It decreases you know expenses. It decreases opportunity. It decreases operational efficiency. It ensures preparedness. You know, for business. You know, so at this point, I'd like to say thank you very much. You know, for your uh, you know, time and for your attention. Uh, let me quickly, in a GP, if permitted by Mr. Moderator, just, uh, just uh, quickly show you a business continuity plan, uh, you know, a sample of one that I prepared, you know, in the past. And then to just run us through. Uh, I hope I'll remove the name of the company. I just hope so. Uh, you know, so it's showing on your screen. So that you see all of those, so you can see. Okay, so this is the table of contents. You know, the, the 
you know, for depending on the business anyway, you know, you can see that there's objective. You know, I have an executive company, I have you know objective, then I have I have waste management plan, I have list of potential waste that can disrupt business. That was what I meant by critical activities. You know, you can see that I have you know a risk assessment, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, part of that document. You know, there's a business impact analysis, you know, section, and then of course. Uh, incident response plan and all of that, and plan activation. Um, you can see that the incident response team, those are the things that I talked to you about. You can see that there's communication. You know, then you can see contact list. Yes, you have the team that will communicate. You have the contact list of the stakeholders, you know, that you need to carry, you know, along. Then you can see the recovery plan. Then you can see that, you can see immediate response plan. You can see those things. Then you can see, you know, recovery, uh, you know, action. Then you can see resources required to carry on, you know, the critical business. These are configuration, you know, in your business continuity plan. Then test, evaluate, update, you know, and so do. It's sometimes depending on the company, uh, you know, it's not something that is the same thing for everybody. You can see how I have outlined their activities, you know, and all of that, you know, just for the purpose, you know, uh, you know that. I'm sorry I didn't send this to you, but there's a need to send to you. I will need to remove you know, time, name, and you know, all of that. Uh, you know, so on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to say once again, uh, thank you, Ethan, for the opportunity to do this. And thank you for your cooperation. You are very participative. You are very interactive. I will yield the floor now for any comments or any questions or any clarification. Thank you very much.